There's an old saying that adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. That was certainly the case with Nate Parker's The Birth of a Nation. Everyone was made to show where they stand when it comes to race in America because of that film, and for the black community, black men in particular. The results were certainly eye-opening, to say the least. A lot of people walked away from that experience angry. Some of us walked away annoyed, but not surprised. This video is going to address the gender divide in support for black-led movies this past year. Not merely that, but the bulk of the video will, of course, go to that subject. And let's get this out in the open from the onset. Not all black women are with the nonsense, and if you happen to be part of the contingent who's got your head on straight, then good for you. But there's a reality here as to why so many black women supported, say, hidden figures and had nothing whatsoever to do with the birth of a nation. And that has to be addressed as well. All of this, by the way, has been sparked by the recent DVD release of The Birth of a Nation. That's what inspired this video, and the fact that I don't feel as if there's been any attention given to that. And this is wrong. By the way, for those of you who trashed Birth of a Nation, I've got some choice words for you, too. Human garbage like Amber Phillips, Jamila Lemieux, and the rest of the Bedwinch Buck Dance Brigade were out in force spewing their lies, and now it's time for the good guys to have their say. You know, there are movies that the dominant society doesn't like, and then there are the movies that the dominant society knows that they have to kill. The Birth of a Nation was one of them. Hidden Figures, on the other hand, was not. In fact, white people seem to love that movie, and it's not just because they're trying to, after the fact, manufacture a smokescreen for themselves to hide behind in order to cover up their blatantly racist takedown of the birth of a nation. White people actually like Hidden Figures in and of itself for reasons all their own. Now, looking at the recent box office data, Hidden Figures, to date, has made $40 million, $24 million of it its first weekend in release. And this is the second weekend in a row that Hidden Figures sits at the number one spot at the multiplex. That's two weeks in a row, but then again, let's be honest here. January is a month when the movie studios dump the films that they don't really care about. And that's not to say that Hidden Figures is a bad movie. I haven't even seen it, and I'm not going to. But I'm just stating the reality of the movie marketplace and the way that the industry works. Now, since January is a dumping ground for flicks, it also means that it's a month-long opportunity for a strategically released film to find its audience and become a sleeper hit. This has happened several times in the past, by the way. Like The Birth of a Nation, Hidden Figures was also brought to the theaters by 20th Century Fox, though unlike The Birth of a Nation, Hidden Figures was actually made by 20th Century Fox. And that matters. Nate Parker actually had to roll up his sleeves and to call in a lot of favors and to pass the hat around numerous times until he had enough money to make the movie. And since he was the one who scraped together the financing himself, that meant that he could make the movie his way. This is the reason why, unlike, oh, say, 12 Years a Slave, you had Birth of a Nation that didn't portray any white saviors. There's like one white woman who's shown somewhat sympathetically, but this ain't a movie about making white people feel good. This is a movie about telling it the way that it actually is. And I use present tense deliberately. Slavery isn't over. It never ended. So, Hidden Figures came out of the gate, being a product that was crafted by the very same racist forces that did everything they could to kill the birth of a nation. And they've given it a big push. Hidden Figures already has an Oscar campaign for itself going. See, that's what they do with movies that they want to succeed. They got their little template. They've got their game plan together. 
and the movies that white people look at and say, yeah, this movie definitely makes sure that white people feel good about it. Those are the ones that they sit there and, and support. Everything else, they run into the ground. I mean, all of these blatantly insincere for your consideration ads that you see online for it. I mean, the only ones that are actually genuine are the ones for screenplay cinematography. Now, those they're given a push to, but I couldn't help but notice that don't see too many having to do with for your consideration for Taraji P. Henson or her other two female co-leads. See... That's the way that white supremacy plays the game. You think that you're on the team, but the truth of the matter is you're not. And as for the birth of a nation, they're burying that one. You're not seeing too much of anything. In fact, I haven't seen anything at all in the way of for your consideration for that film. Now, this movie was just released on DVD and Blu-ray. Got a lot more attention than Hidden Figures, but of course it got the wrong kind of attention. The kind of attention that sends the signals, hey, this is not a movie that's approved of. What are you idiots doing having congratulated Nate Parker in the past? You shouldn't have done it. We need to bury it. And just so you know, I'd have, I was so eager to once again give my support to this movie that even though I saw it and even though I don't really care to um, build a... a home video library, I went ahead and got my copy of The Birth of a Nation. Got it on DVD. I considered um, going ahead and, you know, ripping some scenes from it to go ahead and post with this video, but then I thought, last thing I need is to trigger a copyright strike, so that one got um, done in. But for those of you who have not gotten your copy, get it. It's it, not just because of the fact, this is not some nonsense about, oh, we need to go ahead and support it because... Nate Parker was standing up to white supremacy. He's a, get the doggone movie because it's a good movie to watch. Get the movie because this is one that is bare knuckles in the face to white supremacy. I saw all sorts of things in that movie that I looked at and said, white people are not going to like. No wonder white people were so incensed against it. There's one scene in particular after Nat Turner has led the rebellion at the Turner Plantation, and he's gotten the rest of his freedom fighters together at another staging ground, and he asks one of his brothers, what time do you think it is? He's looking up at the sun and going, you know, what time do you think it is? The guy goes, five, maybe 5.30. Nat Turner pauses for a moment and says, you know, about this time, I'd be finishing two rows of picking cotton. Another one of the brothers is talking about, you know, I'd be finished um, trying to clean out the barn or the stables or what have you. Another brother says, I'd be having some um, hot water prepared for Massa, dreaming about dumping it on his head. That, that, that got to me. And because of the fact that it was not a huge moment, but what it showed was these guys had had their lives regimented to white supremacy. Every breath that they took of every day was accounted for on a clock that was set up by white supremacy so that you knew from sun down to, from sun up to sun down what your day was going to be they had the oppression down to a science now anyone black white or otherwise who's ever worked a nine to five that ought to be able to resonate with you right then and there. In fact, that's one of the things that they used to call wages when the concept was first created. Called it wage slavery. Mainly because you're sitting here working for somebody, but you don't own any of the company. You only get what they choose to give you. So, that scene in particular stuck with me. A lot of the scenes, I mean, most of the movie is eminently notable and quotable. It has just basically a litany of hard-hitting scenes, stuff that you're going to be able to see, but it's not based on being gruesome. Though the big scene that a lot of people are going to remember the most is when Nat Turner was taken to a plantation back, you know, when the slave owners had him basically working a circuit, if you will, where he would go from one plantation to the next, using the Bible to tell the slaves, y'all need to listen to Massa now, slaves obey your masters, you know what that book says, you know, God likes, a, God likes a happy slave. And there was one scene where 
you had this overseer who was saying, oh, you know, I got one of these slaves here. He refuses to eat. Going on a couple of days now. You just don't want to eat. And finally, what they do is they pry the guy's mouth open. And the overseer takes a hammer and a chisel. And he knocks out the guy's teeth. Just starts knocking them out. And then when the guy's sitting here with a mouth full of blood and broken teeth, they put a funnel in his mouth and shovel food into it. That moment will certainly stick with you. And while Gabrielle Union made a perfect ass of herself, talking of basically trying to figure out why the movie couldn't be all about her, maybe the fact that you're asking Gabrielle is the reason why it's not and shouldn't be, the way that um, there are two rapes that are depicted in the movie, but they take place off screen, as they should. This is not a movie that basically is going to sit here and try to exploit the brutality. It's a matter of showing what it was that these people were going through that made Nat Turner say, you know what, I've been spending all this time justifying the enslavement of my own people, and I've had enough. And another scene that definitely got my attention, and this is not going to be some sort of spoilers review, though if you got a history book, this shouldn't be spoilers at all. There's a uh, sequence where Nat Turner's owner buys a woman at a slave auction, and she winds up being presented as a gift to the plantation owner's sister, who lives at another plantation. So, you know, Nat Turner's kind of got this long-distance love affair going on. Don't worry, the movie doesn't become bogged down with it. They do, you know, just a brief enough scenes to show Nat Turner is, of course, taken with this young woman's remarkable beauty, and he's not the only one who noticed. Some good old boys decide that they're going to have their sick fun with her. They ambush her one night and gang rape her, and she's severely beaten to the point that she's unrecognizable. Nat Turner has to beg the plantation owner to, um, if he can go see this woman to see if she's all right. When he goes to see her, the scene is, as you'd expect, disturbing. She's shown with a swollen face. She's just to the point where you don't even know that it's her. And Nat Turner's like, tell me who did this. I'm going to find out who it is. After you, uh, after you tell me, I'm going to go find it. I'm going to go deal with it. And the woman, you, she can barely speak, but she makes out the words. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. You taught me that. And here, you know, Nate giving a fantastic performance. Is Nat Turner, he's just cracking up at this point. Not laughing, but, you know, crack, he's breaking down. It's like, oh my God, because he realized now what he had done. He sat here and programmed all of these black people with the idea that they were supposed to submit to whatever level of abuse white people decided to mete out. And slaves were supposed to happily bear their burdens. Ain't that what he taught? And here he was with a woman that he cared about. And she has been outraged by some white thugs. And here he is just wanting her to simply give the name, tell me who they are. And she's not doing it, not because because she doesn't want to, but because of the fact that he programmed her not to. He indoctrinated her not to. He brainwashed her not to. And it was this moment that struck me more than any other in the film. Because it showed the fundamental immorality that Nat Turner had been inadvertently helping to promote. Now, I'm not going to talk more about the film because I want you to see it, but those two scenes in particular are ones that I took away from it, and I'll tell you right now, the movie is full of scenes like that. I mean, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to watch this movie and then just, you know, go back to whatever the world you may have been doing online. This movie's going to stick with you, and it should. The movie is just that profound. It receives my highest possible recommendation, and I'm not even a film critic. But, as terrible as the depictions of slavery are, it is the film's depiction of the white characters where it really reaches its highest potential 
and where the movie shows its real strength. Once again, this movie made white people not merely uncomfortable, but it made them furious. No white heroes, but worse than that, this movie doesn't portray the white racists as mouth-breathing bigots. You know, caricatures like The Blind Side. Hollywood created the basically this straw man cutout of a cardboard racist. Basically, he's shown as being a demented bigot, constantly spewing racial slurs. We all know that this character, this caricature, doesn't really exist in the society. He's just a ridiculous cardboard cutout that Hollywood gets to put on screen because white people can look and say, well, that's a racist, certainly not me. And they can go back out and perform white supremacy and practice racism without a pang of remorse because, after all, Hollywood showed them a ridiculous caricature that doesn't really exist, and white people get to feel, well, that's not me. Not this movie. Hell no. This movie portrays the white people as pretty much uniformly racist, that all white people in the movie are, in fact, bigots and racists. That's refreshing. That's a change, and it's about damn time. But more importantly than that, it doesn't portray them as being a caricature of bigots. It shows them as just being average white people. The guys who gang-raped the woman who Nat Turner was fond of, they're just average white guys. You know, they're not, even, they're, they're not these refugees from Deliverance or something. They're not sitting here going, come here, nigger girl. They're like any other white guy you would imagine. And the guy who uses a hammer and chisel to knock out the slave's teeth, the guy is actually one of the more affable figures in the movie. He's not presented as being some, ah, I hate niggers with a passion. Instead, he's just a white guy who, as far as he's concerned, it's another day at the office. Nothing unusual going on, just my day. When they tell Nat Turner to indoctrinate black people with Bible verses so that they'll submit to being slaves, those plantation owners are presented no differently than any other supervisor you probably had on a job. When Army Hammer's benevolent slave owner finally shows his true self and he threatens to lynch Nat Turner and the other male slaves because they refuse to hand over a black woman to be raped, by a fellow plantation owner at a party. When these black men were like, you know, we're not handing her over, Army Hammer was like, I'm trying to make a business deal with these men, and if you mess this up, I'll see all of you lynched by morning. Except he's not portrayed as being a mouth-frothing animal. He's portrayed as the exact same kind of entitled white people that you meet and talk to every single day. Oh, it's not hard at all to see the problem that white people had with this movie. It is that portrayal of white people as just naturally racist, the banality of white supremacy that angered them more than anything else. Nate Parker, bless his heart, he made it a point that when white people watch this movie, they're going to see themselves up there on that screen. This is not going to be a comforting caricature. This is going to be the real deal. And that's why they had to kill this movie. They didn't have a choice. The fact that white people hated this movie as much as they did, that ought to have been proof enough for black people that there was everything right with this movie. It's when white people approve of something. That's when you need to be suspicious of it. That's the stuff you need to stay away from. But of course, black people are always taking their cues from white people. White people didn't approve of Vernon Johns. He was one of the forerunners to Martin Luther King. White people didn't approve of Malcolm X. And as a result, black people didn't either. It was only decades later when all of a sudden we got all of these Malcolm X supporters in the baby boomer community who all of a sudden remembered, oh, I love Malcolm X back in the day. Uh, no, you didn't. And we see it today, even now. You got black people who are like, well, if white people are sitting here saying birth of a nation ain't no good, I'm going to say it too. Well, you know, I understand why white people are against this movie. I understand fully. I understand why they're telling black people that the movie was sold out when it wasn't doing all these little tricks to undermine the film. 
white people have always feared black people, particularly black men, finally coming for some payback because they know that it would be an ass-whipping fully 500 years in the making. And after Ferguson and Baltimore, white people are on edge to the reality of black discontent with how we have been treated by them and that some of us are looking and going, God dang it, enough's enough. They've always controlled the images, and that's part of how they controlled us, a big part of how they did it. But here was an image that they couldn't control because they didn't create it. So white opposition to this movie was totally understandable and predictable. But my question is, why were there black people who decided to join in on this as well? Instead of a movie that moved the needle like the birth of a nation. Instead, what we see black people putting their dollars behind is hidden figures, which is just another movie that comforts white people. Look, some niggers learn how to do math for us. That's what you see with these movies where white people are trying to pretend as if they're congratulating this or that person. It's always if you're of use to white people. If you stand on your own two feet and say, we're going to build something aside from white people, we're going to stand up to white people, we're going to take power from white people, they ain't trying to promote that. But if you sit there and, you know, you go ahead and find your comfortable place under white supremacy. Oh, I'm willing to go along with, you. Yeah, we had some problems at first, but you know what? These white folks, they is all right. They'll go ahead and promote that. Hidden figures doesn't empower because they never challenge white people. Instead, they're dancing and laughing. That's what the promotional stills are all about anyway. Very interesting. The Birth of a Nation's promotional stills show Nate Parker and the boys, they're knuckling up on white supremacy. The production stills for Hidden Figures shows the black women dancing. No wonder white people were so comforted by it. See, they couldn't do that with The Birth of a Nation. And the director of Hidden Figures is some guy I'd never heard of, Theodore Melfi. He's white, naturally. And he wrote the screenplay, along with another white person, Alison Schroeder. About the only other film credit that she's got is Mean Girls 2. So you go from a crappy comedy about white girls in high school to an allegedly serious drama about black women. See, that's just how things go in Tinseltown. And please don't go fooling yourself thinking that this movie making $40 million means anything. It's more, first of all, it was the timing of the movie's release that helped it. Timing is everything. I remember when Creed came out, I was like, that was a movie that needed to be reserved either until January or February of the following year. It didn't need to be released at Thanksgiving. I mean, you, you put it right between the final chapter of Hunger Games and Star Wars The Force Awakens. You can't get any oxygen when you position yourself like that. But you know, at the end of the day, they looked at the film, they saw that that um, Ryan Coogler put together a hell of a good film. They were like, sheesh, this thing really is the best Rocky since the original. And they were like, hmm, we want it to be successful so we can get our money back, but uh, we ain't trying to make no superstars here, and this movie could probably do that, so we want to go ahead and limit it. So they sat there and chopped the knees out from under it, gave it a release date that they knew was not most advantageous. See, I keep telling you, in Hollywood, it ain't about green at all. It's about black and white. So, if anything, Hidden Figures is just more of the same old pseudo-white savior fluff that won't make white people feel uptight. It's like the help only with rockets. And the only ones who will get anything from this movie's success is going to be this Theodore Melfi character and Alison Schroeder. It's just like straight out of Compton. If there are any awards to be given, they're going to go to the white people. The black folks in the film, they're going to be overlooked just like they've been for this whole For Your Consideration Oscars award thing. See, they're talking about the cinematography. There's a lot of uh, those little, you know, ads and banners that you'll see online for that For Your Consideration Best Cinematography, Hidden Figures. 
Screenplay, same thing. But you ain't seeing a whole lot when it comes to the actresses. Gee, I wonder why. Speaking of not having seen them, I haven't seen the movie, and I don't have to. I can smell it from here. I know exactly what it is. It's the same cut-and-paste nonsense white people are always pushing on us. A movie that will reinforce the white lie that white people are racist and mean, but, you know, underneath the meanness and the racism and the bigotry and the name-calling and the burning of black churches and the shooting of black people in the streets, if, if you can get past all of that, you know... They've got some inherent sense of fair play, too, and if you just put up with enough of their abuse, assuming they don't kill you first, why, you'll be able to touch their pure white hearts. Don't overthrow white supremacy. Don't challenge white supremacy. Hell, don't even question white supremacy. Instead, you try to find your place in it. Why, white supremacy has a place for you. If you just persevere long enough, why, you'll find your place under white supremacy. And it ain't so bad. See, that's what Hidden Figures was produced to say. And that's why white people love it so much. It's the kind of film that says that the status quo is all right. Meanwhile, the birth of a nation was attacked and assailed and slandered from all sides, but the main onslaught came from white people who were clearly threatened, who clearly recognized what the world they were seeing, a black man who mounted a major effort that told our story our way and didn't put in the lies that would allow white people to feel comfortable about what they do. And the other contingent that attacked this film, tragically, came from black women. Not all, before the usual people who are trying to figure out a way to say, Ooh, he, I, I kind of feel like he's talking about me. I may well be. But not all black women were on the bullcrap. But the problem is, this movie, the opposition that came out against it, the people who spoke against it, and the ones who remained silent... It showed that not all black women were on the bull crap, but the problem was enough of them were. And while I'm not going to sit here and say that Birth of a Nation's, you know, less than um, stellar box office was somehow all black women's fault, the problem happened to be you do not crash this kind of film without having at least a majority of widespread opposition from within the black community itself. I fully, I fully agree that there was an enthusiasm gap of sorts among black men, but the thing is, black men, while they do go to the movies, they don't do it like black women do. It's kind of like talking about, you know, consumer culture a as a whole. Women, by and large, are the ones who are running around being conspicuous consumers. Especially in the black community, Thanks to 60 years of white supremacy undermining our community economically, what they've done is they've made it where women make sure they make sure that women are black women will be able to get a job more readily than a black man or at least government assistance. So what happens is they're going to have a few more disposable dollars than a black man will on the average and movies are not a necessity. That being the case. It's going to be whoever has a few extra shekels to rub together. That's going to be more than likely who's going to be able to partake of that, especially when it comes to paying the higher price for a movie theater ticket. Tyler Perry, Will Packer, look him up, and even Steve Sambo Harvey have made their careers in Hollywood releasing movies that were meant to appeal primarily to a black female demo, or at least a movie that, from a marketing standpoint, could be geared toward a black female consumer more easily. Now, Nate Parker, having a white wife, apparently, for a lot of black women, that's a deal-breaker for you. But apparently, Janelle Monet, who's in Hidden Figures, you're cool with that. Now, this woman dresses like a man. She wears men's business suits constantly, bow ties the works. Okay, so Jaden Smith dresses like a girl, and you call that out, and you should, but this is okay. A black woman running around in business suits all the time, dressing like a man, got her hair up like a flamboyant flaming homo, 
it's bad enough that she's sitting here clearly trying to project to the world, look, I'm sexually ambiguous, which of course is just code for I'm a lesbian, and I just wanted to say it because it might be detrimental to my brand. Whenever Janelle Monet is asked about her sexuality or whatever, she always dodges the question. Whenever she's asked if she's a lesbian or not, she just says, eh, bisexuality is okay, and she keeps her personal life to herself. This strange creature is the very walking definition of intersectionality. She's the poster child for the kind of ethno-gender schizophrenia that is undermining the black community, but I don't see the black women who derided Nate Parker whining about her. So Hidden Figures has a woman who runs around in men's clothing, and I ain't talking about one or two photo shoots. This is Janelle Monet's brand. Her brand is that she runs around in men's clothing. And that means something, because in the United States and Britain, you know, a lot of these Western European countries, the lesbians, the white lesbians, early in the 20th century and late 19th century, they made it a point to identify themselves as lesbians by wearing men's clothing. And I ain't talking about running around just in pants. That's not necessarily a radical thing, but they'd be running around in men's suits. You know, so they could clearly make it uh, obvious to everybody, hey, I'm a, I'm one of the beards, I'm a bull dagger, whatever the hell you want to call it. They wanted to make it clear, you know, I'm batting for both teams, or at least I'm batting for the other one. That's what white lesbians would do. So when you see Janelle Monet running around with a bow tie on, and she's got her hair up in a pompadour, you know, she's sitting here trying to clearly signal to everybody, hey, you know, flaming lesbian over here. Okay, you know, what she chooses to do in the bedroom is her own choice, but... I'm asking, you know, why is it that I'm not seeing black women getting exercised over this? I mean, where's Jamila Lemieux? Well, probably hoping for a date with Janelle. And that whore's gallery of dysfunctional swirlers, lesbians, and undercover carpet munchers, they've all been silent because they actually approve of this. They support this. And all you black women out there who lent your voices to the We Hate Nate Parker campaign, just keep in mind, this is what you've been helping to promote. See, under white supremacy, when it comes to attacking black men, it is never an end unto itself. It's always a means to an end. The goal is not merely to denounce Nate Parker. It is to hold Nate Parker as being emblematic of black men in general. And that's always been the target. Unfortunately, I'm willing to bet more black women than are willing to admit to it recognize this. Because you had black women across the board, straight or gay, in media or out of media, those in Hollywood and in other professions, all of them united in their open, just bitter opposition or covert opposition to this movie, and not even one of these black women had anything bad to say about the movie itself. Isn't that amazing? In the case of Amber Phillips and Jamila Lemieux, they never actually saw The Birth of a Nation. They admitted themselves. They didn't actually see it, but they didn't have to. They just didn't like it. You don't know anything about the movie other than it's about Nat Turner, but for you, that's enough. So, Obviously, the opposition to the movie didn't have a damn thing to do with the movie itself. And no, it had nothing to do with the fake rape accusation against Nate Parker. Black women are very confused on this issue. The ones who were sitting here making common cause with the dominant society, proclaiming in one breath that black men are frequently falsely accused of rape, but all of a sudden with Nate Parker, uh, you know, there's probably something there, you know, probably something there. Obviously, you had some black women who looked at Nate Parker as being a proxy for black men in general, whatever delusions of, you know, black men, they're out here dating out the race. And all, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, they looked at Nate Parker as being a proxy for their misplaced rage. And they wanted to show black men, you know, we're going to show you who's boss. 
because when this black man was proven innocent of raping a white woman, that didn't mean anything. The dominant society needed black women to spew these lies because they were a ready audience for it. And it is not harmless, by the way, when you allow yourself to willingly be used as a prop to give cover to the people who oppress us. That is not a victimless crime. While you try to convince yourself that Nate Parker did something, well, I'm only opposed to what Nate Parker did. He didn't do anything. Yes, he did. He must have. Well, what did he do? He, he, he makes black women feel undesirable. You know, the only thing worse than victimhood is phony victimhood. And of course, the white media was there, helping them out the same way that they help white supremacists who look for rhetorical defenses of police shootings of black people. The white media gives you a talking point that you can hide your prejudice behind, and then they disallow any commentary to the contrary. There is clearly a type of collective groupthink that's at work when it comes to black women in America, a group think that we don't see in any other demo, not even black men. The dominant society has fostered and encouraged a pathological hatred of black men by black women. Not all, but at this point, yes, we are dealing with more than 50%. Deal with it. More than 50% of black women who are either openly hostile toward black men, or at the very least, passively hostile, which is a distinction without a difference. The problem a lot of these black women had with The Birth of a Nation, the movie itself, was that it dared to show a black man leading. And whether many black women want to admit it or not, they hate that. A lot of black women give the occasional lip service to allegedly wanting black men to lead, but the second a black man does, they immediately start looking for reasons not to follow him. They start looking for excuses to hang their hats on as to why they just can't obey what a black man says. I, uh, I, I can't follow him. I just can't. Something's wrong here. The problem is he's a black man leading and they don't want to follow him. That's the problem. The last three generations we have degenerated into a matriarchy. And this is what a matriarchy is, by the way. Matriarchy doesn't work. Let's just say a period point blank. Matriarchy does not work because matriarchy is inherently regressive. Patriarchy works because patriarchy is inherently progressive. You can't be a patriarch unless you build something. With matriarchy, all you have to do is to produce a live birth. You know, presto changeo, congratulations, you are now a matriarch because you got some mouths to feed that you can't feed and a lot of black women love the fact that we are a matriarchy because they get to indulge some sort of ridiculous girl power fantasy that they're actually in control of something when they're not what are you in control of children that you don't have the means to support a community that is in tatters because you are not the economic engine for a community, and a culture that is schizophrenic and decaying. To a lot of black women, though, it is far better to reign in hell than to have to serve in heaven, and this rebellious spirit has been encouraged by traitors within our community, principally self-hating opportunists, and that ridiculous caricature of a human being, the black feminist. Sisters, I've got news for you. You have allowed lesbians and sellouts to inform your decisions. People who want nothing to do with black people and who openly hate something on the order of 97 to 99 percent of black people. Most black people are not uh, homosexuals and they at least 50% of the black population are male, which means a lesbian has no shot with them. And at least 95 to 97% of black women happen to be heterosexual. So again, if you're a black lesbian who's trying to look at the black community as a potential dating pool, you're SOL. Unless you can find a way to drive a schism between black men and black women. 
run black men into the ground. Tell black women you don't need a black man. Certainly not in the bedroom you don't. And the idea is to isolate black women, or better yet, get black women to isolate themselves. And hopefully at that point, now they will be more susceptible to some lesbians' advances. That's the scam that's going on here. And if you went along with attacking Nate Parker, then you played your part in promoting that scam. And don't tell me that you haven't, because I don't see any black women calling them out. All I see are just varying degrees of agreement. And I know what the leverage is that these feminuts and sellouts have over the majority of black women. It's largely emotional. I mean, there's been 60 years of ego stroking, and it has made it now where a lot of black women's pride is now about a foot thick. Now, I'm no Bible thumper, though I do believe that, you know, religion in general holds some wisdom. And when I think on the fact that black women can't even admit to what they are doing and refuse to even speak against these whores who are deranging our community, I can't help but think of the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, For rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is like the sin of idolatry. Now, when you act deliberately against the best interests of your people, when you make common cause with individuals who you know to be our enemies, that is rebellion. That's what rebellion is. And when you are given correction, yet you refuse to admit to what you've done, and worse than that, you keep on doing it, that is stubbornness. You often hear me use the term recalcitrant. Recalcitrant means lawless. You look at the Old Testament, you have the um, Hebrews saying that the Ten Commandments and such, these are the rules that we live by. They weren't merely saying, when they say the rules that we live by, it doesn't just mean these are the rules that regiment our lives. That's not what they mean. We got to live by this. They mean, the true meaning is, these are the rules that guarantee that we will live. These are the rules that enable us to survive to see the next day. That's what it means when they say these are the rules we live by. These are the rules by which we are able to continue living. And I rather like 1 Samuel 15, 23 because of its way of putting it, because it shows the underlying psychology of this mindset. When people are being stubborn, have you ever noticed that they tend to act with a kind of religious zeal about it? I mean, you just can't shake it. To them, they are on their own personal holy war to behave in a particular way in the same way that Lot's wife simply would not let go of her adoration for Sodom and Gomorrah. Too many black women will not let go of this girl power fantasy that they've been indulging. They never seem to feel that it's the wrong time to sit there and say, black girls rock. Even when you have a movie about a black man who's standing up to white supremacy, the first thing that they say is, the black women should be leading the rebellion. What about them? Give me a break. They've programmed themselves. And while the programming can be broken, first you have to let it go. Problem is, black women realize they would have to live with the embarrassment that as late as the 21st century, they were letting white people goad them into attacking their own men in front of our enemies and actively undermining what black men were trying to do. And that all it took was just the flimsiest of rationales given by the white dominant society in order to get black women to go along with it. It is this unspoken understanding that you won't have to take responsibility for what you've done that the truth would require them to accept the horrifying scope of this betrayal. That's what keeps black women from doing what they know to be right. And it's also what keeps us on this treadmill now, unless you admit that a behavior or a particular belief is wrong, unless we make it official and put it on the table, then we can't make progress because we're holding on to this corruption. 
it's like a computer that's got like a malware virus, you know, until you first root it out and then purge it from the system and make sure that it's not part of your life, that it's not part of your operating system, then you're not going to be free from it. It's always going to be there and it's going to be screwing things up consistently. And in order to purge a corrupt influence, you can't do it until first you declare that it's there. You got to say it. Our communities hollowed out and our enemies, they are freely killing us in the streets. And because three generations of black children, particularly black boys, have been raised by females, we are reacting to this genocide like women. Historically, women have been very easy to conquer and to integrate into the conquer system because of two reasons. The first, ethnic loyalty simply doesn't mean the same thing to women as it does to men. It certainly doesn't have the same importance. Listen to me before you get ready to throw something at the monitor. Men have to compete to pass on their genes. That's just a biological reality. Women, on the other hand, have exactly the opposite problem. They've got a plethora of choices, making it where passing on their genes is a decision, not an obstacle. So, to women, the importance of ethnicity will never mean the same thing as it does to men. This is why the qualifications for what men and women consider desirable in a mate is different. A woman wants a man with some resources because she's already got genetic security. And the main criterion that men seem to have for a desirable female mate is that she has to be simply pleasant to be around and in good health. And lack of ethnic loyalty matters because of the second reason, which is closely related to the first. Historically, when a conquering army invades, they kill the men and the women take up a submissive posture before the invaders. And this submissive posture always takes the form of them on their backs, legs wide open. I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm trying to be just blunt about it. Because that is the historical reality. Women offer the invaders their wombs because they feel that this always has some sort of value. And even if the woman's womb is no longer on the table, well, at the very least, she's offering herself as recreation. That's just a fact. Women find it very easy to submit to invaders. Men do not. That's the reason why, ladies. Men do not find it easy to submit to an invader unless they are taught to. And this is the reason why we see so many black men dancing in the streets and showing out for the cameras after the police murder a black man. They're not acting as men who have been taught that when an invader kills one of yours, you are at war. Instead, they're acting like a bunch of females. See if you can placate the invaders, show them that you mean no threat. Too many black women have now come to totally identify with white supremacy, and we see this most clearly when we look at the way that they rear their broken families, particularly their sons. They depend on the white power structure for their job, or for the few that they can get in, their education, or whatever government assistance they're on, they look to the white-owned media to stroke their egos for a sense of self-esteem, and to tell them that they're doing just fine when they're not. So whether they've got the moral courage and intellectual honesty to admit it, the truth is they do identify with white supremacy. And the foundation of white supremacy has always been to ensure that white remains dominant. Now, this absolutely requires that black remain not merely subservient, but at the very bottom. After all, if white is supreme, then the further you get away from white, the worse things have to become of a necessity. Now, this is not a natural state of affairs at all. It's the world the way that the European has twisted and distorted it to be, but they've turned their perverted racial delusion into our reality, largely with a lot of black people's help. You can't have it both ways. Lip service isn't enough. 
always looking for an out when it comes time to support what a black man does is not acceptable. Now you hate brothers being on the down low, but when you got a woman like Janelle Monet who is all but out of the closet, that's cool. And Pharrell Williams has gotten a couple of quickie interviews because apparently he did the music for Hidden Figures. And that guy is damn near a flaming homo himself. He dresses like a five-year-old, but the only thing he's missing is a propeller cap. I'm pretty sure, though, if I go on Google Images, I'll probably find one of those pretty quick. I mean, it's obvious that he is trying to project to everyone that he's in the closet. And he tries to surround himself with females as a means to throw the majority willing to believe otherwise off of his scent. I mean, that tactic, using females as camouflage for homosexuals, that's as old as the bathhouses. But the thing that just disgusts me the most is black women know damn well that when they sit here attacking black men in media who are trying to build something, trying to do something, you never see black men going on a jihad over black women in movies. I mean... Waiting to exhale was just a non-stop, black men ain't spit, fest. Just every frame, every minute of the movie was meant to scream loud and clear, black men ain't worth a damn, black men ain't nothing, and being with a black man is the worst thing that will ever happen to a black woman. Same thing with the color purple. Same thing with set it off. Recently, I had one of Tyler Perry's crappy produced movies. I know I got to be a little bit more specific than that. For colored girls, the help, movies that star black women make it a point to show black men as being absolutely good for nothing. And black women never express any dismay at this. You don't see black women sitting there going, gee, you know, why aren't the black men being uplifted in these movies? No objections at all. Black men are not featured in hidden figures, and yet there is a strident defense of that being given. It's not a movie about black men. The main characters are black women. Interesting, because apparently that's a sufficient enough explanation for any movie starring black women, but why is it that it's never acceptable for a movie starring black men? A movie that is about a black man killing white people precisely because of their countless outrages against black women. And apparently the only thing that some black females could say was, there should have been more black women in it, more prominent roles. The movie's called The Birth of a Nation. It's the biography of Nat Turner. I'm sorry if Harriet Tubman didn't make a guest appearance. Black men have never come out saying that, well, we refuse to see such and such a movie because of the past of so-and-so actress. Oh, she was sleeping with a white man? Uh, deal breaker, can't be there. Now we could. Maybe we should start. But to date, we've never done it. Not even once. And we've had plenty of opportunities. You know, black men's loyalty to black women has been abiding and absolute. We don't make it a point to attack black women in front of white people. And we damn sure don't cheer for them to fail at something. Even if black men don't approve of the material or the creators of a particular film, you still never see us going on an all-out war to try to sink a movie starring black women. And not one of these damned movies ever uplifts black men. Not even one. You name it. If it's a movie with a black woman or women leading it, then the black men are either abusive or just otherwise worthless or just not seen altogether. And yet black men don't try to destroy these movies. Yet black women think nothing of ruthlessly attacking any movie with a black man in it, and then they think up some half-assed talking point to try to justify it. And it's always the same thing. They felt that it disrespected black women somehow. And apparently everything disrespects black women. What about The Birth of a Nation? How did that movie disrespect black women? Well, Nate Parker disrespected black women. That's what it is. 
But he wasn't accused of assaulting a black woman. Well, he should have married a black woman! It's always something. Now how the hell do you build when this is the type of partner that you're supposed to be building with? Black women want support to only go one way, and that doesn't work. Cooperation is not a one-way street. The double standard has been blatant and ridiculous. But this is where we are. And the selective outrage is sickening, especially when it's orchestrated by our enemies and serves to strengthen them. Affirming images of black men are important, and the lack of those images also matters. Our enemies certainly seem to know this. But you know, October was when the war on birth of a nation reached its epogee. You had a literal army of black female online scribblers, and one or two male ones for that matter, all using the same talking points, which you could tell were clearly spoon-fed to them by their white handlers. You had a bunch of black females who sat there willingly being meat puppets for white supremacy. And since they couldn't force Nate Parker to give a false confession, since they couldn't get him to denounce his own film, they instead decided to use their media monopoly to just outright defame the movie by false association. All of them saying almost word for word the same damnable lies, using this movie as a proxy for Parker. The white media had already said that Nate Parker mistreated women. Now they were going to place the same slanderous label on the movie. And these sambos were out here writing pieces with titles like, We need to talk about how badly this movie treats women. How the birth of a nation dishonors Rosa Parks and black female activists. Gee, is anyone going to talk about how the help dishonors Dr. King and black male activists? Here's another one. Nate Parker failed the women of birth of a nation. By the way, these articles that were released in October with titles like that, the, the list of them goes on and on. I'm not going to bore you with this garbage. They just took all their lies about Nate Parker that they had been telling, about Nate Parker and rape, all of their pathetic talking points, and what they did was they deleted Nate Parker and instead put in Birth of a Nation, so that their attacks on Parker were cut-and-paste attacks of his movie. But it wasn't just black women. There was also a black... I'm not sure what to call this thing. One of these homo thugs who works for white supremacy, a chump calling himself D. Watkins. I'm convinced that the D must stand for dumbass. Well, he wrote a hit piece that he had the nerve to entitle Nate Parker is not a victim. The birth of a nation filmmaker needs to stop talking about his innocence. This is supposed to be a black male writing this crap, openly demanding that a black man stop telling people that he's innocent, even though a jury, a white jury, found him so. After assailing the movie Five Ways from Sunday, dumbass Watkins, only giving the briefest of mention to racism or slavery, by the way, decided to end his little hit piece with a three-paragraph long rant about how, quote, Parker was charged in a country that denied rape, making him guilty even if he was proven innocent. Well, good thing that America doesn't deny racism, otherwise Nate Parker would have had a good defense then, wouldn't he? Well, before that, dumbass Watkins wrote, Nate Parker was charged, went through the system, and won. Congratulations on beating a system that has a history of mistreating women. Uh, yeah, because America has no history of mistreating black men, right? That's why women are the majority of America's prison population, and not, say, black males. Oh, wait. Ah, but the verbal vomit wasn't over yet. This moron then wrote, Parker needs to come to terms with how he continues to benefit from the very system he seeks to dismantle. 
Now, if this stream of mental sewage seems like it came from the mind of a certifiable lunatic, well, it probably did, but that's not to say that there wasn't some reasoning, perverted though it may be, behind it. You guys will probably remember that a few years back I did a video about the reality of black female privilege. You can still find it on YouTube. Now, in the video, I took down another black male who was panty-begging, and a lot of black men realize that numerous black females have signed on to the feminism bandwagon, so these chumps try to use the terminology of white liberals who talk about rape as if it was far worse than racism. That's the scam that this D. Watkins chump is trying to use, and he's not the only one. White liberals are forwarding this agenda to try to help do their part to make it where racism is not a front burner issue and this is one of the tactics that they use white liberals have appropriated the language black people use to describe white privilege and these white people principally white females lesbians in the main have launched an all-out jihad to try to appropriate those same talking points and substitute the word rape for racism you can probably guess what happened next. A lot of black women, and I do mean a lot, found out that they could get an easy one-day writing gig for this or that white website if they were willing to repeat this garbage. That way the white publications would have a black face to hide behind. But you only get a one-day gig out of it. After they use you to be their crash dummy, they immediately bring in the white females who they wanted to do this to sell the soap all along and you get shown the door. And a lot of other black women felt that they could garner some quickie attention for themselves if they also trafficked in these ridiculous talking points, never mind the fact that a black woman's biggest problem is not sexism but racism. Go ahead and tell Sandra Bland that her gender was her biggest problem. Go ahead and tell Rakia Boyd that institutional patriarchy was the biggest problem that she faced. And some undercover homos and panty-begging black males desperately hoping to get something approximating a female to look in their direction decided to follow suit. You guys need to know this scam when you see it. Whenever you see some male, particularly a black one, talking that crap about Black men benefit from the system. Understand that you are talking to a coon. Full stop. Black men fill the prisons, lead the unemployment rolls, and are under a full assault on all fronts in this country. Black men are the vast majority of people convicted of crimes in America, and also the majority of those later released because they have been wrongly convicted. We die sooner than any other demographic in the country, and we suffer the worst quality of life. Black men have zero benefits in this country. But when you're trying to get some butter biscuits from the dominant society, that's the kind of crap that you have to say. Because what dumbass Watkins is simply too dense to acknowledge is that the only reason Nate Parker was under a spotlight was because of the movie that he'd made. Nothing that he said or did could possibly focus on rape culture because the media didn't give a damn about rape culture. All they cared about was demonizing him and his film. See, if dumbass Watkins and the other feminists truly cared about what they claimed to see as a lack of concern about rape, then what they would have done is spend their time attacking the white media. But they don't. Why would they? They work for the white media. You had also another piece of human garbage, Imani Walker, who posted a hit piece saying that she adored Nat Turner. Uh, yeah, sure you do. But that there was no way she was going to see Birth of a Nation because, well, the accusation against Nate Parker was simply too severe, you see. It was simply too much, and she didn't feel that he had been appropriately sorry for the fact that he was even accused of a crime. 
Gee, wasn't Nat Turner also accused of harming white people, and as a result, he's been censored from the history books by the white majority? I suppose that irony was lost on this empty-headed piece of dirt. By the way, you can just look at this one and tell that she's clearly a lesbian, intersectionalist, whatever. And she's also a frequent contributor over at The Root. Once again, another white-owned website. These places use their websites to promote a particular type of Negro mouthpiece. This is the class and caliber of individual who acted as the forward element of the attack on the birth of a nation. This was a classic high-pressure tactic that they were all collaborating in. The white media using paid stooges to go after a target for the sake of creating the impression that, oh, black people as a whole were just leading the charge against Nate Parker when in fact... The clowns who were out there doing it were being paid by white people to do it. And these guys, they came off like, when you look at their articles in the aggregate, it just comes off like a cheap interrogation being performed by some incompetent amateurs. These clowns just kept demanding that he confess to something that he didn't do, and when, they, when their pressure failed to force him into a confession, they were just like, well, the very fact that he refuses to talk about nothing but rape, that's the crime. Oh, so we went from confess to the crime to, well, the fact that you won't confess, that's the crime. And of course, the white lie of it all is, well, if he would just acknowledge rape culture, the, the media would lose interest. The hell they would. The second that he sits there and says, well, you know what? About this rape thing, ah, guilty conscience, guilty conscience, guilty conscience. Their job, these black mouthpieces, was to be the crash dummies for the white character assassination that was going to follow, and it did. After all, now the white powers that be had an open door given to them by these sambos. And now the white media could come out and, and they could launch the kind of attacks they really wanted to, to accomplish. And they could deny being racist, because all they had to do was point to the clowns who had written the articles right before them and say, hey, we can't be racist after all. Other black people are saying it. We know because we paid them to. And afterwards, the white people like Kelly Lawler of USA Today began their attacks. She claimed that the birth of a nation's rape scenes misportrayed rape. That's two lies for the price of one. You can't sit there in one breath and say that a movie misportrays rape when in fact it doesn't show the rapes at all. It merely alludes to them. And by the way, this is a classic white catch-22. If Parker had shown the rapes in graphic detail, then people like Lawler would have been faking outrage and saying, Oh, Parker, he was unnecessarily exploiting the rape of black women, and clearly he was reveling in his own crime. He was getting his jollies. He was probably reliving the night that he raped that innocent white woman. But since he doesn't show the rapes at all, just alludes to them, now she's faking outrage that, well, he's covering rape up. We need to see rape in its full horror. You know, I've heard of torture porn, but this is an entirely new level of depravity that white people are sinking to. You want rape porn now? People Magazine posted a story about the fake rape allegations against Parker, except in the piece they came out and called the accuser the victim. They didn't just allude to it, they said she's the victim. Now that is libelous full stop. A white jury found Nate Parker innocent, and since by law he was acquitted, that means there was no crime. Yet the white media persists in saying that there was a victim without a crime, and there was a crime with no evidence. The piece, however, did have one important bit in it, a statement from the family of the false accuser. It said, in part, We are dubious of the underlying motivations that bring this to present light after 17 years, 
and we will not take part in stoking its coals. While we cannot protect the victim from this media storm, we can do our best to protect her son. For that reason, we ask for privacy for our family and do not wish to comment further. Now, you probably didn't hear much about that statement, now did you? Because it wasn't one that the white media could use. And when Nate Parker refused to let them browbeat him into giving a false confession 17 years after being found innocent of a crime he didn't commit, the white media then just decided to hell with it. We're going to put aside all pretense and we're just going to go after the real target. This movie. You had two open homosexuals, Robin Roberts and Anderson Cooper, who both attacked Parker for making a film that they claimed glorified the killing of white people. If they couldn't get him to say that he was sorry for not being found guilty of a crime he didn't commit, then at the least, they wanted him to say that he was sorry for making a film that displeased white people. Or, if nothing else, get him to equivocate on it. Get him to backtrack. Get him to say, well, you know, we probably did go a couple, little bit too far in a couple places. Get him to criticize Nat Turner. That's what they wanted. Get him to say, well, Nat Turner was wrong. He shouldn't have done that. But fortunately, Nate Parker had more steel in his spine than they gave him credit for. He didn't back down. He doubled down. He refused to let white people bully him or intimidate him. And he was not about to besmirch the sterling legacy of a true hero like Nat Turner. Nat Turner was a hero. What he did was virtuous. What he did was right. And if more black people had followed his example, slavery would have ended decades sooner. The hate towards Nate Parker from the black women who engaged in it had to do with nothing more than them trying to validate their own inferiority complex. White people approve of hidden figures. It has the pale skin seal of approval. And when that many white people claim to approve of something with black people in it, that tells me that there's something wrong with it. Same as with the blind side. Precious Monsters Ball, the help. When white people love something, that means that it supports white supremacy. Because they damn sure don't support anything that doesn't. They hated the birth of a nation. No movie in human history has ever been attacked like that one. And media is not about who you're sleeping with. It's about what the images are programming people to think or believe. And people refuse to see through the game white supremacy was playing. And I'm sick and tired of having to wait until the slow coasts finally get off their feelings and see the real picture. And if you think that Hidden Figures is some kind of win for black women, tell me something. Whatever happened to the black stars of the help? Sure, Viola Davis finally got a TV show. But she's not headlining movies. And she's not going to be. When white people praise black actors, it's not because they want to see more of them. It's because they did a specific role that made white people feel good, set a tingle up their hairy legs. And let's be honest, white society knows how to push black people's buttons the right way. And merely showing white people being even marginally appreciative of black people, well, that's enough to make a lot of black people swoon. A pat on the head from Massa goes an awfully long way with some black folks. But it's always a backhanded compliment. Denzel Washington got more praise from white people for training day playing a crooked cop than he got in the entirety of his career combined. And a lot of those white people who sat there writing articles praising Denzel Washington, they made sure to take cheap shots at the rest of his ovoir. They sat there attacking the rest of his performances. Too saintly. 
too clean cut. He needs to do something more realistic like this. And Training Day was hardly Denzel Washington's best work. White people only praised it like they did because they wanted to see if they could normalize the idea that Denzel would play a stereotypical black criminal. Fortunately, he didn't take the bait. But it says a lot that white people used their media to try to see if they could influence or otherwise coerce Denzel Washington into making a total career change that would have been detrimental to him. Because they never whine about Tom Cruise always playing the good guy, or Harrison Ford. They never complained that Kevin Costner is always playing some near saintly individual, but a black man does that, and all of a sudden they have a problem with it. He's too clean cut. In other words, he's not giving us the kind of image that we want. We want him to prove that he's the bad nigga figure. Black men occupy a special place in the minds of white supremacists because we are the ones who will bring white supremacy down. Men don't submit. So when you add this refusal to submit to white male authority, to the fact that black men have dominant genes, you realize why white men hate and fear black men above all other things. But they've managed to isolate black men by getting black women to sign on to white supremacy. And when black women do the old, yeah, but black men, thus and so, all you're doing is making my point. I suppose the problem is that I take the issue of media a hell of a lot more seriously than most. I understand that this is not about entertainment. It is about mind control. Media is about planting ideas in people's minds. It is about showing them through imagery how they are to behave. As Dr. John Henry Clark said, the media controls people through images. If they can control what you see, then they can control how you see yourself. And if they can control how you see yourself, then they can control what you do about yourself. And the dominant society's support for these images shows what ideas they believe in and to what extent. Remember when I taught you about wheresoever a man's power is, that's where his treasure needs to be too? This is why putting a dollar figure on media is important. White supremacy derives two crucial benefits from the white-owned media. They indoctrinate you with their ideology, and they get paid for it. Now, if you want to add a third, you could say that they impoverish you in the process. They get you to disadvantage yourself, and you help to work to justify and subsidize your own oppression. This is not a game to me. I understand that it's not harmless when we allow people to speak against us even if those people are allegedly black, we have allowed there to be entire safe spaces within the black community for all manner of foolishness and outright treason. And for the clowns who get their noses bent out of joint because lately there's been a real emphasis on calling out those black women who give moral support to white supremacy, that's because the black community is a matriarchy. And that matriarchy is not supported by black businesses. It's being supported by the dominant society, the dominant society's government and their corporations. Black men who coon get called out daily. They are sanctioned targets. And it doesn't require any courage to call those guys out, mainly because these sambos, these black male sambos, are clearly licking white people's boots or other parts of their anatomy. And since our people stopped being patriarchal in any real sense decades ago, it doesn't cause any significant problem in our community to call out black men who coon, because you never see anyone defending them. But when you point your finger at black women for any reason at all, all of a sudden the black community is in turmoil. Too many black women, not all, but damn sure more than 50%, 
have this instinctive reaction to hearing any kind of criticism. And it wouldn't bother me except for the fact that black women signed on to white supremacy six decades ago and have been acting out its agenda ever since. When will black women call this out? That's what I'm asking. All of this undercover black feminizing is not fooling anyone, and giving silent opposition is no opposition at all. White supremacy uses its media to psychologically masturbate black women, and that matters because black women are the ones being given material support by the white power structure. So it is not harmless when black women consistently attack and undermine media that black men are trying to create. That actually moves the needle and takes a step toward expressing an authentic black voice. And then these same people put money into the pockets of Tyler Perry or some other white director making a do-nothing flick whose only purpose is to make black people, women in particular, think being the helpmates to the white government is somehow something to be proud of. Because it's no accident that Tyler Perry's Medea Halloween movie came out right after the theatrical release of The Birth of a Nation. And it's also no accident that Hidden Figures came out just before the home video release. And now we have the white media attempting to manufacture Oscar buzz. Well, they're only doing half Oscar buzz for the white people involved with hidden figures? Or does anyone truly believe that Taraji P. Henderson is going to walk away with an Oscar? This is the media equivalent of the rope-a-dope. They sucker you in with what you think is going to be some sort of advantage or reward, then they knock you out. This is not just about one particular movie or one particular filmmaker. This is about a sustained and deliberate pattern of behavior that's been going on for decades. Black women think that the reason you go to the movies is for psychological masturbation, which ironically is the same reason white people go. But I'm telling you that movies are not supposed to be about that. Media is not supposed to be about that. I've told you for years now that to the white men who own the media, they don't see themselves as being in the business of entertainment. They see themselves as being in the business of mind control. We don't need to see black people trying to find a comfortable place under white supremacy. We need to see black people challenging it and for the sake of tearing it down. We do not need to see black women trying to sit here and find excuses for why it's okay to take cheap shots at black men. We need to see black women looking and saying, you know what, we understand the media scam going on and we are going to destroy it. Now, before I end this video, I'm going to close out and say that The Birth of a Nation is now out on DVD. And just in case you're not that kind of person, you know, in case you're trying to go green or whatever, you can get it online. You can get it at Best Buy, Walmart, iTunes, Amazon Video, the whole nine yards. There's no excuse for not getting it. And as for hidden figures, well, there's really no need for me to support it. After all, white people already do.